Good evening, everyone. It's 630. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation. Um, welcome. I'm Cindy Harn, Executive Director of the Nature Foundation of Will County. And I'll be your host tonight for our presentation with Stephanie Frisch of the, Z the Xerxes Society. Um, for those of you joining us out from outside the Chicagoland area, or maybe you're new to our organization, the Nature Foundation is a nonprofit charity that raises money in support of the Forest Preserve District of Will County's programs and initiatives that protect nature, inspire discovery, and bring people in nature together. Um, your microphones and videos will be turned off during the presentation. And if you're new to Zoom, which I doubt by now, but just in case, you can adjust how you view this presentation in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. You can toggle some different switches until you get to something you like. Um, we are recording our session tonight, and it will be available for viewing on our website and YouTube channel. I'll send out an email when it's ready, probably by Friday for sure. Um, we'll have time for, after the presentation for questions, and we'll just use the chat for um for answering those. So just type your questions in there. Um, just a couple notes of gratitude. These seminars would not be possible without your interest and without speakers like Stephanie who are willing to share their knowledge, insights, and experience with us. And we're also grateful for the amazing generosity of our donors and our corporate partners who choose to invest in nature. And if you'd like to support our work, there's a link in your registration confirmation, or you can visit our website at willcountynature.org. So Stephanie is an agronomist and native plant material specialist with the Xerxes Society. Based in Northwest Indiana, she provides pollinator habitat expertise to farms in Canada and the U.S., and she also works with the native seed industry and researchers to plan and develop seed supply of important plant species critical for insect habitat restoration. Prior to her work at Xerxes, she was a plant materials and conservation programs manager for 11 years at the Nature Conservancy's Kankakee Sands Restoration Project in Northwest Indiana. She's author of 100 Plants to Feed the Monarch, right here, I got my copy, um, as well as an author and contributor to a wide range of Xerxes Society publications available on their website, so definitely check it out. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Stephanie with tonight's presentation, Pollinator Conservation at Home. Wonderful, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, it's a beautiful evening here in greater Chicago land. So um, thank you to everyone who's tuning in here. Hopefully you have your window open and you can have a little bit of nature coming in as well. Um, thank you, Cindy, for that introduction. Uh, I think you... You, you covered it. I won't introduce myself any further. As we get started here, we've set up just a few quick poll questions in Zoom that um, Cindy's going to launch here. So that should pop up on your screen and you can answer that. Um, this, is, this is just for fun. We will hopefully learn a little bit about what we do or don't know. So we have three questions. Anyone able to um, answer that? There we go. <laughs> and depending on how it's showing on your screen, there's a little narrow tab to the right to help you scroll down uh, to questions two and three. Okay, hopefully everyone's able to access that and think about it. We'll just give another um, 10 seconds or so here. Okay. 
Would you like me to end the poll now? That sounds good. Go ahead. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So the first question was roughly how many species of native bees are there in the U.S. and Canada combined? And the correct answer here was 3,600. Um, we had a, a few different ranges here, and the answers were pretty well dispersed. This is a tricky one um, to know. But yeah, several thousand native bee species. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those um, in a few minutes here. Number two, which of the following insect groups are not considered uh, pollinators? And grasshopper is the, the correct answer here. Everyone's pretty savvy about wasps, bees, beetles, butterflies, and moths being pollinators. And surprisingly, maybe to some flies are also uh, in some cases pollinators. And then the last one here, which of the following are sources of food for pollinators? Choose all that apply. So nectar, definitely. Um, leaves, yeah, like thinking of many caterpillars uh, during that larval stage in their life cycle, they're eating leaves, whereas the adult butterflies are feeding on nectar. Some of our pollinators feed their young uh, other insects, so that's that's correct here. Wasps, for example, instead of uh, primarily taking back pollen and nectar to, to their young, they catch prey and take those back. Pollen, yep, that's definitely a food source for pollinators. And wood, wood is a little bit of a tricky one here. Um, primarily pollinators don't feed on wood. They can't, many other insects, yes, feed on wood, but not typically the groups that we think of as pollinators. So thanks everyone for participating and thanks Cindy for, for running that. Okay, I'll just give a, um, okay. so Fran, I have roughly 40 slides to get through here. I wanted to give a range of information, but also save some time for as much question and discussion as we'd like to have to go deeper into the particular topics that interest you here. So I'm sharing a bit more background about the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. We're a science-based nonprofit uh, focused on invertebrates, and our name Xerces comes from the pinned butterfly specimen shown here, the Xerces blue butterfly. It was the first butterfly to go extinct in the U.S. due to human activities. Uh, this happened in California in the 1950s, and at the time, a group of concerned butterfly conservationists organized themselves together with the mission to prevent that from ever happening again. Uh, in, in the 51 years since that event created Xerces, we've grown now to over 80 staff in 26 states, and our main office is in Portland, Oregon. The way we do our work is organized into several different program teams. As shown here, we, we focus on particular uh, groups of endangered vertebrate species, we have a pollinator conservation team, which is really habitat focused, both from the government funded programs, as well as with private sector partners. I'm in the pollinator conservation team. I'm really a plant ecologist and restoration ecologist. So again, we're on the habitat side of invertebrate conservation. We also have staff dedicated to topics around pesticide reduction and mitigating the risks of pesticides to invertebrates. A lot of outreach and education activities and efforts and also communications, our, our uh, publications. So if we look at the more than 2 million species that have been described so far, um, on Earth, not, not counting the microbes here, but 70% of those are invertebrates. So that's what we're seeing in the pie chart here. These are all invertebrates uh, in the blue colors. And then we've got fish, birds, reptiles, mammals, and amphibians um, in the, the green and black there. So this is just showing animals, but then broken down into those major animal 
groups where about 95% of them are invertebrates. And sorry, of, and of all of these um, insects, uh, only about 2% of them are what can be considered pest species. They're, they're doing something damaging or that humans don't like. So we have this huge diversity of, of insect life. And so kind of logically, it follows that the fate of the world's insects is inseparable from our, our own. They are in so many places and nooks and crannies and habitats, and they're involved in all these big processes of nutrient cycling and uh, decomposition of plant matter back into the soil. They balance populations of other uh, insects and small animals. They also turn plants into food. So picture here is this caterpillar that's been uh, having a herbivorous diet, eating the leaves of plants. And now this bluebird has caught it and is going to go feed it to its chicks. Um, same for seeds. The, the insects that pollinate flowers and turn those into seeds, many, many other insects and vertebrates eat those seeds. And then that follows also on the last slide here, Seeds are the, the way that plants reproduce as well, both our crop plants and, and wild plants. Yet kind of in, in every habitat and every, um, every habitat where they've been studied, insects are shown to be in decline. So either the number of species or the abundance of species is decreasing. And there are four main categories <clears throat> that are the threats or the reasons for this decline. Uh, so the arrows here show that. And then at the bottom are the actions that, that we can each take or do to counteract these threats. So for habitat loss and degradation, we can work on things that conserve or create habitat. With pesticides, we can reduce our reliance on pesticides for disease and non-native species. Um, this is kind of talking about how honeybees, for example, are not native to North America and the, the use of them, the use of other managed bees like a bumblebee colony that's in the photograph here, they can spread disease uh, among wild bee populations. And also we have non-native plants and in other invasive species that have a negative impact on the biodiversity that, that insects are a part of. And then finally, climate change, just with these dramatically shifting uh, extremes in temperature and precipitation and a kind of different timing of the year when some of these events are happening is, is also negatively impacting insects. And one of the suggested actions for this is, is kind of back to the habitat piece, but planning and including a lot of diversity in habitat so that they can um, be resilient and, and respond. You know, there may be some plants that are, are less tolerant of drought, but others in, in that diverse mix that are more tolerant, as an example. So when we talk about uh, invertebrate or insect pollinators, these are all insects here. There are six groups, butterflies, um, we've, we've included skippers here as well, um, moths, flies. And then in the bottom row, we have examples of beetles, wasps, and bees. And then I've also added an, another um, image here. So this is an aphid being eaten by a predatory fly larva. And this is an example how, how pollinators can also fit in the category of what we call beneficial insects. So at the larval stage, this fly is a predator of, of aphids, which can be pests to some of the plants and crops that humans want to cultivate. And then as an adult, the fly is visiting flowers and, and feeding on nectar there. So there's some crossover certainly between how these groups um, function in their ecology. 
So we talked about roughly 3,600 species of native bees in the US and Canada. And here's a picture of the, the main groups of bees. So you can see there's a lot of um, Apidae, Calididae, Halictidae, Megachilidae, the Melitidae, and the Andrinidae going around the wheel there. And at the, the top, we have the bum, bumblebees and the honeybee. So those are probably the ones that people are most familiar with and could recognize and name. But you can see just what a small fraction they are of the total bee diversity. And like I said before, honeybees are really cool animals as well, but it's pretty accurate to think of them as insect livestock. They're a non-native species and, and humans manage them, manage them because we want their help pollinating our crops or because we want uh, to harvest the honey or beeswax from them. So they're, they're just one fraction of all of our other these species that are, are wild and native here in North America. I'm going to go through some uh, basics of life cycle and, and bee nesting behavior for these. This is a way to, to simplify, not going through all 3,600, of course, and not even going into much detail on those, those groups that were highlighted in the pie chart there. But um, We've got three main nesting behaviors that are useful to think about when starting to learn or understand native bees and then think about what are their habitat needs, what's their life cycle like. So on the left is what a bumblebee nest looks like. They don't have a comb like honeybees, but they do create these waxy uh, pots where each larva is kept is is um, fed and cared for there, and species wise, bumblebees are about one percent of the total um, number of native bees. And then in the upper right, stem or tunnel nesting bees. So if you've seen those bee houses that have the hollow grass canes in them, those are made for this type of of bee and their nesting behavior. But of course, in the wild, there's many, many stems and of plants or other places where these, these tunnels or tubes exist naturally. And that's about 30% of the native bee species. And then the overwhelming majority, around 70%, are ground nesting bees. They um, excavate a small tunnel and and chamber and raise their young in the ground. Here's a, a real nice series of photos showing that. So on the surface, a ground nesting bee's nest can resemble um, an ant nest and underground as well. Like I said, there's a, a tunnel that will lead to different chambers. And then in each chamber, the, the mother bee will place this is a solitary bee here, so they don't have colonies. Just a single bee excavates this tunnel. She goes and gathers the, the nectar and pollen and forms it into that kind of brown orange ball there. That's known colloquially as bee bread and then lays an egg on it, which hashes into the larva. That's, that's kind of the white little worm there is the baby bee and that baby bee eats the pollen and nectar, and then pupates, and then will emerge as an adult. So sometimes these are in turf, but you know more often than not, these bees prefer to nest in places with undisturbed, but soil that's not covered by too much vegetation. Like I said, the, the stem nesting bees will use hollow stems. They might use holes that beetles have bored into wood previously, or the snags are as a standing dead tree, or rotting wood, for example, or in some places where there's lots of snail shells lying around. That can be another site where these bees make their nests. And they're also out collecting mud or leaf pieces 
or sawdust because they, they partition their nest into different sections. They don't make the chambers like the soil nesting bees, but it's the same idea. They, they collect that nectar and pollen together, lay the egg on it, and each larva that hatches has its own food source to eat. And then when they pupate and it emerges adults, they chew their way out. And then bumblebees, they are a social type of bee. So every spring, the queens have mated the previous fall. They emerge from overwintering and found a new colony. And then their first brood are kind of all uh, worker bee sisters, and they help somewhat to raise subsequent generations that summer. But in terms of the number of individuals, a bumblebee colony is, is much smaller than a bumblebee, than, than a honeybee colony. And they need kind of hollow cavities. So places like abandoned um, rodent or other small animal burrows, brush piles, even in grass litter or, or tree cavities. So back to our topic here of, of pollinator conservation at home. Even in the wild, but thinking now about at home, it consists of these four general components, the, the food sources, whether that's nectar or pollen, kind of all throughout the different seasons when pollinators are active. If the, the larvae go and eat their own food, like the caterpillars we've talked about, those particular host plants need to be there as food sources. And then for wasps or the parasitoid pollinators that feed their young uh, animal food sources, those need to be present as well. Shelter consists of these, these nesting places that we just talked about, as well as places where uh, the overwintering stage is protected from the elements. And then also in shelter, we include um, protection from disease and competition from managed bees, as well as um, protection from pesticides, ideally. And then the more connected and the bigger that pollinator habitat is, also the more effective and resilient it is. But certainly small pieces of habitat can also have a significant impact. So Xerces has also tried to distill these, these same messages in what we call bring back the pollinators uh, by following these four simple steps. So it's the same things you, you want the, the pollinator friendly flowers that are providing all those food sources, places that provide nesting sites, be mindful to look how pesticides might be in the environment and try to avoid those or reduce them. And then spread the word, communicate about what you're doing. And there's a, a link on this, this is a taken a screenshot from one of our website pages. Then anyone can click on this pollinator protection pledge and add your your site to the map there to show that you're working to do these four actions for supporting pollinators. So the next part of the the talk here, I'm going to go through those those actions and provide a bit more detail here. Xerces has a lot of resources. Uh, to be quite honest, it can sometimes be overwhelming. But if, you, if you're kind of having a question or looking for something, my recommendation is just put those terms or that question in your web search and then also add the word Xerces to it. And that's one of the easiest ways to find your, your way to our resources here. So. We have newly updated plant lists. These are available for all regions of the United States. On the right here, I've just shown a few of those as an example. And then on the left, a, a bigger view of what the list looks like for the Midwest. This is just a two page thing. So you're just seeing the, the front page here. And then the backside or second page is a continuation of the list of suggested species. And there's a load of information in these tables. Uh, a lot of that's achieved through icons here. 
So there are no photos and there's no height measurements, but there's the, the common name, scientific name. When it blooms, it's a perennial or an annual. If it's a, a four, meaning like a wildflower, a grass, a tree or shrub, a vine, it tells you how much sun it needs, it tells you what the soil moisture requirements are, and then you get all these other icons and additional details of whether it's also a plant that is a larval host or particularly supporting specialist bees or beneficial insects, bumblebees, because it provides some kind of nesting materials, et cetera, et cetera. And then we've highlighted some in bold and with stars as Xerxes staff favorites. And these are also all ones where availability has been considered. So there's something that from your local native plant sale or larger retailers or online sources of plants and seeds, these plants are available and they're well suited for use in, in home gardens or other park or common green spaces. Also just like to mention that grasses are pollinator friendly too. Our grasslands are open sunny habitats that we think of when we, when we talk about pollinator habitat. Those have a lot of grasses in them in nature as well. Um, that's providing again a lot of these overwintering sites or protection for pollinators. Xerxes has two tools on our website that can help you to find suppliers of plants and seeds. Um, one is called the Native Plant Seed and Services Directory. And this one focuses more on characteristics of the supplier. So you can see there's all these drop down filters that you can choose from. Um, if you're not, if you don't have a preference about that, you just leave it as any. But you can see in the lower left, if you wanna know what specific practices this supplier is doing to reduce or avoid pesticide use, there's a, a filter for that, also if they sell native, native milkweed, um, where they're located, how much of their business is focused on native species. So there's a lot of interesting traits. And then once you conduct your search, you, you get the results and then you can click on each result and read a more full profile. So, um, and like the title says, these are suppliers that are providing either plants and or seeds and or related services. Uh, it does not get into what particular species they carry. We don't try to manage that. We just leave it up to you to contact each supplier about their inventory. We do, however, have the milkweed finder, which is a separate tool, and that is a simpler set of pull-down menus where you can filter by state. You can choose a particular milkweed species, or if, you're, if you want any, you leave that as any. Then you can choose if you want um, plant seeds or rootstock, and then that will return um, suppliers who have that particular species. So that's a bit about providing those food plants. The next set of slides are more on nesting sites. Um, so for stem nesting sites, again, planting species that have these hollow or pithy stems, and then not cutting last year's growth down, but leaving it to stand is important because that's where uh, there may be nesting or overwintering happening there. So we have this really nice guide available on our website that kind of shows you when the bees are doing what in the stems and then how you can uh, manage and, and keep those stems for the pollinators. There's also a document on nesting and overwintering habitat. I think this is like a 12 page guide. These are all available as free PDFs and this gives many more concrete examples and guidance about how to maintain or be aware of nesting sites and overwintering habitat for pollinators. 
all these examples of pithy stems and rotting wood and kind of brushy cover and things like that. All right, so we've done um, food and shelter, and now we're gonna talk a bit about protection from pesticides. And I'm starting here with a study that several of our staff conducted uh, a few years ago, and then it was published in 2022. And in this, we did pesticide sampling of retail milkweed plants. So, you know, often when you go to your garden center, what plants do you want to buy? You want to buy the plants that look healthy and big and robust. And so the, the wholesale growers may be using uh, pesticides as well as some fertilizers and, and other inputs to really grow plants that are robust and that look good when they get to the retail market. But our concern or our interest was well, what pesticide residues are larval monarchs encountering, right? Because now the, the idea would be that consumers are buying these plants and planting them out because they want insects, in this case with milkweeds and monarchs, they want the caterpillars to be able to feed on them. Um, so we visited 33 different stores selling milkweed plants of various species in 15 states. So the map there shows where um, those stores were located. And the orange arrows indicate the, the migratory path, like after overwintering, where are monarchs moving into their breeding habitat, where they're actively seeking milkweed to lay eggs and then the caterpillars are feeding. So we had pretty good coverage of milkweeds that would likely be planted where monarchs are active. And the results here was that every plant that was sampled was contaminated. The lab looked for 92 different pesticides and 61 of those were found. 24 of those were insecticides, 26 were fungicides, 10 were herbicides, and one of them was a synergist. And on average, there were 12 pesticides per sample, um, but the overall range was as low as two to as high as 28 different pesticides on a single milkweed plant. So this was really intended to get a baseline idea of what pesticide residues might larval monarchs potentially be exposed to. And now our, our pesticide staff is in the next phase of working on providing guidance to both the, the nurseries and consumers on um, what to look for, what to be aware of, and questions to ask when trying to buy be safe or pollinator safe plants, as well as, as from the grower and retailer perspective on how to offer those kinds of plants. Okay, I'm, I'm changing topic here a bit and I, I can't go into this too much for the sake of time, but this is a great tool that we have against another PDF and it's habitat assessment for pollinators and it's focused on yards, gardens, and parks. It's very colorful and it walks through section by section for each of these aspects. So this is where you kind of do a before and after. So you assess your site like the, what's shown here is for foraging habitat. So how much um, vegetation, how many, how much of, of your site is flowers? And then you give yourself a score for that. And you work through these other aspects too, the nesting habitat, the pesticide practices and the community action to come up with your total score. And as this walks you through, you start to see kind of ways that your habitat could be improved. And then you may take several months or a few years even to enact those differences. And then you repeat this and you give yourself your score for after. Um, so this, I think, is a really wonderful tool to print out or use digitally to look at what, what's going on around the habitat that you're creating or caring for. So with Cindy, we also um, wanted to talk a bit not only about pollinators and what they're feeding on the flowers above ground, but also soil 
invertebrates. And this is an illustration. These are they're hard to see soil invertebrates because they're they're in the soil or they're in that layer of organic humus right there. But this is a wonderful illustration by Jim Nardi, a retired professor from the University of Illinois, that that shows just a little snapshot of the diversity of invertebrates that are in the soil. At Xerces, we have uh, some resources and some training related to this. We have a publication called Farming with Soil Life, and we have ongoing online trainings about this, and the recordings are on our YouTube channel. So you can really do a deep dive into soil invertebrates and soil health through those resources. And um, I guess pop quiz here on the photo on the, the right. I just took that, that's my hand holding a soil invertebrate um, two nights ago. Does anyone know what that is? If, if you wanna venture a guess, please put something in the chat. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead here and share that that's a the larva of a lightning bug or a firefly. So in their larval stage, they're living in moist soil and they're feeding on animals like slugs and snails and other soft-bodied insects or invertebrates. And they can also be luminescent where their abdomen has chemical light. And if you're in a place that's that's dark enough so that your eyes can perceive it and these firefly larvae are there, then they're easy to see. These are often called or referred to as, as glow worms. So we have um, several nice resources and a focus on fireflies as well, conserving the jewels of the night. So again, habitat and food are important and light pollution is a concern because it can interfere with their flashing, which is the way they communicate and find mates during their breeding season. One other example of a soil insect that I'm including here are predatory ground beetles. Um, they're mainly nocturnal, so that's another reason why we may be less familiar with them, but they're just out on the surface of the soil hunting other insects. Um, and like it says here, they may consume their body weight and prey daily, and um, I guess they're kind of gluttonous because in some cases they kill more prey than even they can eat. Kind of the, the big hunters of that microcosm. Soil health at home, in the yard and garden. Uh, this is the house where I currently live in Indiana near West Lafayette. And when I moved in, the, the previous residents had put down this you know, fabric weed barrier. And there was already some soil built up on the top of it. So weed, it wasn't doing its job to, to keep weeds from growing anymore. And I wanted to remove it. And as I pulled it back, what was underneath was just this hard light substance that really wasn't living soil. So uh, in the years that I've lived here, I've been working to employ these four soil health principles. And these are often used in the context of agriculture, but they apply here as well. Uh, there's minimize disturbance <clears throat> and maximize cover. And those really have to do with protecting the soil and then maximizing biodiversity and maximizing continuous living roots. The focus of those or the impact of those is to feed, to feed all the, the microbes and then the uh, uh, microinvertebrates, the, the mesoinvertebrates and the macroinvertebrates. So all these small animals that are in the soil depend on the, the plants kind of kickstarting carbon and energy into their food. This is what that same area looks like um, a few days ago. So I've let a lot of wild weedy violets grow in there. 
I've also intentionally planted a lot of our native strawberry species for Gary of Virginiana. It's blooming beautifully now. It is full of at least a dozen different wild bee species, uh, especially on calm, sunny days. I have, I have left the leaves there for some of that winter cover and shelter. And then uh, you can also see though, there's a, a boxwood shrub and that's not the best. That's, that's non-native. It's not providing really much for wildlife, but I, I haven't taken it out and replaced it with something else yet. But shrubs, whatever they are, they can be a good place in landscaping to leave some open soil available for ground nesting bees because it's, it's more hidden from view for us, but it's still very accessible for those bees. So if, if you want, this is very understandable, you want your flower beds um, to be full of flowers and plants. You don't wanna have a bare patch of soil there necessarily, but there are ways to incorporate bare soil for ground nesting bees in flower beds. All right, the fourth action in the Bring Back the Pollinators campaign was communicating. Talk about what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're doing it. Um, a very simple way, simple and passive way to do that is a habitat sign, like these that we have from the Xerces Society that you can put in your yard or along the sidewalk or in your flower bed. Uh, these are available as a gift if you donate and become a member of the Xerces Society, but you can also contact us if you're with another organization or school group, uh, we can provide a sign to you as well. We have a, a program called Bee City USA. And if you're familiar with Tree City USA, this is somewhat similar, but the, the leaders in the community decide that they wanna be a pollinator positive municipality or town or campus even. And they adopt a set of resolutions that have to do with these, these same habitat actions of reducing pesticide use and exposure, improving, the, the plant and food and shelter habitats that are in their town. And they also do a lot of outreach and education and events that celebrate pollinators. Um, and there's a nice video on our, our YouTube that kind of explains how a city or town can begin the process of becoming a Bee City USA. And increasingly, our Bee City USA website is adding more resources about how to work with your HOA to also be pollinator friendly and native plant friendly. Community science, um, this is also sometimes known as citizen science, but it's a way that anyone who's interested and has a bit of training can help provide information that's used to make conservation decisions. Xerxes has several community science projects. The Western Monarch Count and the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper are, are focused west of the Rockies and primarily in California, looking at the Western Monarch population. The Monarch Nectar Database is nationwide, and that's receiving observations. Whenever you see a monarch butterfly drinking nectar from a flower, we want to know what what species that flower is. There's, there's not very much complete information about all the nectar sources that monarchs use. So that project is helping to build that data set. And then there are two around bumblebees. There is Bumblebee Watch, which is nationwide. And that it just involves um, a bit of, of training online and then taking photographs and uploading those taking photographs of bumblebees and uploading them, and then experts verify what species they are, and it provides information about where they were seen, uh, what species it is, when they were seen, and, and more about the habitat or plants that they were associated with. Bumblebee Atlas is what the image here shows, and these are more systematic than, than Bumblebee Watch. Uh, this is where the whole state is divided up into grids. And so 
the, the community scientists are assigned uh, like a square mile or a designated area. Because often, you know, to use Missouri as an example, a lot of people live in St. Louis and Kansas City. And so there'll be more observations of bumblebees there just because there's more people doing the observations. But the Bumblebee Atlas program works to spread people out and to even out the observations. So the whole state is being covered more evenly. And then Firefly Atlas is a um, similar concept, but instead of looking at bumblebees, it's tracking observations of fireflies. And that's focused currently in southeastern states. And this is not so much related to community science, but, but it is related to outreach and learning and talking about invertebrates. It's XKids. And XKids is an activity book that's aimed at the fourth grade level. This also exists in the Spanish language and anyone can download this or write to us for hard copies and use it in your classroom or at home. And each of these invertebrates has a special superpower that you learn about. And then the X kid um, uses their own powers, their own powers of observation or creativity to do small experiments and learn about these. And then once they've completed all of those, they, they receive a sticker or a badge that shows that they too are an X kid. So X is you know, for Xerxes and the main character here is Blue, um, the butterfly. She's the big hero of these invertebrate superheroes. And I'll just close things here with a roundup of our resources. We have so many online trainings and presentations that we've done and recorded and that can be viewed on demand. There's this whole series of gardening for invertebrates. And the one that I featured here is gardening with native plants, learn from our mistakes and our successes. And when I did this screen um, capture in July of 2020, it had, had about 1900 views. The latest is that it's had 41,000 views. So this is a, a great session to learn more about working with natives in your yard, whether you just have um, a balcony and you have a container or, or any size larger yards. Also in this series is one called Managing the Pests in Your Garden. So this is looking at ways that you can reduce any reliance or use on pesticides by adding diversity, by using non-chemical pest management methods. Um, we also have several books. These, we don't sell these, but you can get these wherever you like to buy books from. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that 100 Plants to Feed the Monarch next. And then non Xerxes books that I, I like to recommend if you wanna learn more about some of these pollinators. There's Butterflies of Indiana, a field guide. Of course, there's also the really good Butterflies of Illinois, a field guide. Uh, tracks and sign of insects and other invertebrates are, you know, sometimes you see a case or you see a web or you see these tracks or tunnels. And this is a book that helps you connect, you know, what insect or animal made that, um, that track or sign. Bumblebees of, of North America. And then finally I have garden allies here. These are, like it says, a lot of the animals that you're likely to be able to observe right in your own yard or garden, learning more about what they're doing, what their lives are like, and how their ecology interacts. Heather Holm, I don't know, Cindy, have, have you had Heather, or will you be having Heather as the speaker, maybe? Yeah, we've uh, we featured her last year, so we'll right. probably have her um, again in the coming year. Yeah. She's a super knowledgeable entomologist and a really gifted photographer and communicator. So she has the two books I've featured here that, that provide more biology about the, these bee groups and then pollinators and native plants goes into to those relationships. 
She also has most recently authored um, a book about wasps. And in 2022, it was uh, one of the winners of the American Horticultural Society Book Award. Uh, Doug Ptolemy also had a new book, The Nature of Oaks, that was a winner this year. Uh, there were three winners. And then I'm humbly but proudly also glad to say that the Bezerci Society 100 Plants to Feed the Monarch was the, the third winner in that group. I've included um, an image of the table of contents for that. So you can see part one really focuses on monarchs and their biology and creating habitat for them. Part two is focused on the plants they need. We have a whole chapter about milkweeds. There's roughly 90 species of milkweed in the United States. So a lot to talk about there. Um, you may not know there's a few plant groups that are closely related to milkweeds, but not technically the same as milkweeds, but monarch caterpillars can also eat those and develop successfully. So we talk about that in chapter four. Chapter five is an overview of all the nectar plants that are our wildflowers. And then chapter six looks at tree shrubs and vines. With that, um, it's a big roundup, but I also just want to recognize that all the work we do at the Xerxes Society depends on all of our members and donors. So we welcome you to join us. And I will close here with a mural and the idea that we can all be some change right in our own local um, communities for invertebrate conservation. So thank you. Thank you, um, Stephanie. Thanks. That's a great mural. That's beautiful. Yep. So happy to take any questions um, or just see in the chat, like what are, what are you doing already or what have you seen others do along these lines for pollinator conservation? Yep, if you guys are looking at your chat, I just put a question in there. What are you doing or what have you seen others do for pollinator conservation where you live? Whether it's patio, um, containers, yards, parks, farms. So if you have some things you want to share, share them with us. And while you're writing those down, I've got a couple questions. If you want to tackle some of those, Stephanie. Um, someone asked, what plants have you included in your garden to attract pollinators? So I guess, what are some of your favorites and have you been successful? Mm -hmm. um, so I have the, the wild strawberry that I, I showed a photograph of. I love that one for many reasons. It's, it's beautiful. I think we, you know, even if we picked our own strawberries, we're focused on the berries many times, but the, the leaf shape and the flowers are very sweet. It feeds and attracts, like I said, at least a dozen different pollinators. So it's also a nice place I can just step outside my front door and do a little bit of, of pollinator watching with those. The leaves stay, stay green or turn red even throughout the winter. So it provides year round cover of the soil. It's low growing, but creeping like a ground cover without being aggressive. So that's also helping fill a lot of space in the garden. And then um, this particular species does produce small, very tender and very delicious strawberry fruits. So that's, that's one of my favorites. And also it can be more of a challenge to provide flowers in our gardens that during this time of year, during um, during spring. A lot of these bees that have overwintered are coming out of their overwintering this time of year and they're hungry. They're looking for food. So uh, wild geranium is another good one. If you have a yard that still has spring beauty in it or in, are in a wooded area with um, other wildflowers, spring ephemeral wildflowers. If you're not in that situation, we can also think of trees and shrubs. A lot of them bloom quite early in the spring. And one of my favorites for that is the, the Eastern red bud. It's, that's such a beautiful color. It contrasts with the bright green as the leaves are coming out. It's a small sized tree. Um, so that's also good 
if your yard tends to be on the small side. And if you've ever observed a red bud in flower on a warm spring day, there's just tons of bumblebees visiting it. Yeah. Great. Those are some of Thank my favorites. Mm -hmm. Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving to herbicides. Um, my question relates to herbicide use to remove invasive woodies and plants, especially when establishing or maintaining a prairie or savanna. What are your thoughts on this related to insect conservation? This is a, a great question. And um, my, my background before joining Xerces was in ecological restoration. I've used a lot of herbicide to manage habitat. And there, there are trade-offs, right? Of course, we want to bring back biodiversity, and that often removes involves removing invasive species. And one of the more effective ways and efficient ways to do that is with herbicides. Um, I think the things to to remember, like beyond the, you know, of course, regular herbicide safety applies, but. Um, if you're removing plants that are otherwise providing resources, autumn olive, for example, right, that's actually a really great pollinator plant. But if you're going through and just kind of wholesale removing that, be sure there's a replacement food source for any pollinators in that area because they, they may have become really dependent or the autumn olive has displaced everything else. Um, you know, you may be doing harm, especially in that particular season. So either do it in stages or make sure there's replacement or alternate sources of food when you're removing those. And in some cases, um, you know, so, so that's one, as you're using herbicides to remove plants, make sure you're not removing all the food sources or shelter for some of these pollinators. And then there are limited studies and they're done on honeybees. Honeybees are kind of the, the lab research animal for insect research. Um, and so the results may or may not apply to not to insects that are not honeybees, but herbicides can actually infect them by killing off some of the microbes in their gut flora. They have a microbiome, they have a healthy gut flora as just like we do. So insects can be sickened or weakened by herbicides uh, as they affect their digestive system. But there's more research to be done on that. Um, our next question is from someone that has carpenter bees boring into their back deck. And is there a way to keep them happy and not harm them without them disturbing our deck if possible? Mm -hmm. um, should I add pollinator houses that are already, um, I should add to that, I have a few pollinator houses that are already established, and I was hoping that would encourage them to go elsewhere. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, this is a hard one also. <laughs> a lot of our, our porches and decks are really attractive to carpenter bees. Um, you know, the, the first thing is just decide if they're really doing structural damage or not. In many cases, they're making a tunnel, but it's it's not necessarily affecting the integrity of your of your structure. And while they may seem kind of large and buzzy, um, they're they're not aggressive or necessarily uh, a major concern, you know, for stinging either. So I guess that was my first message was just practice tolerance if if applicable. And the other is, yeah, it's it's hard. Once they've found wood, there are special traps that you can buy, but you can't that they kind of are a decoy where the carpenter bee will tunnel into those, but then it goes into like a jar of liquid where they're killed, right? So that may not be the solution you're looking for. Either um you can certainly leave other dead wood in in your area and hope that it finds those places more attractive but there's no guarantee that they're they're going to go for the the dead tree or the log that you put out there as opposed to your deck so i'm sorry there's there's not like a a good silver bullet answer to that question <laughs> yeah 
Um, someone writes, I saw a picture of rocks in your presentation. Is this useful for overwintering bumbles or do you, or do they need to be in the ground? Yeah, that picture of rocks was an example of where a bumblebee nest might be, um, just because of the, the cavity or spaces that can be there. Usually bumblebees, they, they may nest in a cavity, but they, you know, they'll be more protected if that cavity is underground in the soil a bit than if it were just on the surface in a pile of rocks, but they may be there in the rocks, especially if there's enough um, organic matter and leaf litter built up there. Yeah, we, we may think of rocks as like, you know, not habitat, but it certainly is. It's kind of this sheltered and, and protected place for certain insects. Um, how long does it take pesticide on milkweed purchased from a retailer to completely dissipate or does it? That's also a great question. And that will depend on how much pesticide was applied and how long ago it was applied. And then also whether it's a systemic pesticide, meaning it's taken up into the tissues of the plant, or if it's um, you know, a pesticide that just remains on the surface of the plant. This is just a rule of thumb, um, but two weeks is something that's recommended if you buy a plant, but you're concerned that it may have pesticide residue on it, you can keep it outside because that's where it's going to be happy to live, but cage it um, or put some type of mesh to prevent insects from accessing it for two weeks. And that'll give it a bit more time for some of that residue to, um, to degrade and diminish. Thanks for that question, that was good. Yeah. How long should I keep my old vegetation before I cut it back in spring? This person likes a tidy garden going into May. Mm-hmm, yep. <laughs> um, you, you can do a couple different things. You can still cut it down, but you can bundle some of those sticks or stems and put them in a vertical position, kind of off to the corner somewhere. That's, that's a compromise way to do it. You can trim things, but just leave them laying on the ground over the winter. Um, you can trim them or put them away in a back corner in, in like a really passive compost pile area if, if you've got a space like that in your yard. And then what those diagrams that I showed indicate also is to, to cut this, the stems back to roughly like 10 or 12 inches high. And that's last year's stems. And then for perennials, this year's growth will grow up around that. And the stems can still be there, but they're kind of hidden um, by the new growth. And then the following year, those empty stem, the, the previous stems will be decayed enough that you can remove them and they'll fall down. And then you just repeat that again with the, the most recent stems. Um, outside of using milkweed in your garden, what plant, what specific plants would you include to attract butterflies? Um, any kind of, for any kind of butterfly, um, milkweeds are still a good overall pollinator plants. I'm, I'm taking a little tangent, not necessarily, of course, they're important for monarch butterfly caterpillars, but when milkweeds are in bloom, uh, if you pause and look closely at those flowers, they're full of, of bumblebees, of smaller bees, of flies, of beetles, and of other butterflies as well. So milkweeds are, are great for many reasons. Um, but going back to your original question, blazing star, prairie blazing star, that's um, is the genus and there are several species that are native to the Midwest and um, they're in the sunflower family but they're purple and they have kind of a whole cluster of flowers that forms a rod-like shape. They're very commonly available even in conventional garden centers. Um, 
so and butterflies just love those so that's very mm -hmm. that that's my my topic um, does milky spore have any negative effect on pollinators? Uh, unfortunately, I don't, that's, that's not my expertise and I don't know the answer to that. And let's see, I'm going through to make sure I've got all the questions. I think we might have gone through everyone's questions. Mm-hmm. If there's anything else that you guys have, let me know now. I, I had one question in the chat that was a direct message to me. Sure. Um, if if honeybees are good or bad for the environment, <laughs> and that's also not not a black or white uh, answer there. Um, I don't I don't mean to be flippant or anything here, but Honeybees can often be the entryway for many people into the wider world of, of insects and pollinator conservation. But like I said before, you can think of them as insect livestock. And, and so if someone was said, you know, I'm really into bird conservation, I want to save the, the birds of the world. So I'm raising chickens, I'm keeping chickens in my backyard. You know, that's, that's kind of a, a, a rough analogy. Um, that can also be applied to honeybees. So honeybees can be appreciated for, for what they are. But what I tried to emphasize here was all the diversity of, of native bees that exist. Um, so yeah, honeybees in certain scenarios or concentrations can outcompete. They can consume all the nectar or pollen from an area. And, and then the native bees won't have, don't have enough to eat, or um, there are some diseases that honeybees are more susceptible to because they're living in, in large numbers in very close proximity. And they may be spreading those to the flowers that when they're out foraging and then wild pollinators pick those up as well. Yeah. Great. Uh, one final question. So I've seen, um, Posts on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, you've probably seen things about no mow may, and I've seen pros and cons. So, mm -hmm. where do you stand on no mow may? Is it mm -hmm. a good thing or not? So, I I think the general concept or idea of no mow may is good. I, I'm not a big fan of the actual slogan um, because I don't think it should necessarily just be focused on May. And it's prohibitive. It's about not doing something. Um, and it's only about mowing, right? If we just focus on no mow may, but it's catchy and it's, it's been um, popular. But the, the concepts around it are really, I think, and this is what I like about it, looking at ways that you can think about and manage your, your yard or your lawn differently. Um, um, just because you don't mow doesn't mean that you're going to have a ton of butterflies, right? <laughs> um, but if you mow less, if you mow, mowing less can mean mowing less frequently. It can also mean having a smaller area of your yard that is turf grass that you decide to mow. So, um, yeah, I think if you think of, of no Momea as just having a more wildlife friendly yard, it's a good thing. But if you think of it very, very narrowly as, and it just means don't mow your grass at all during May, um, that's, that's not a practice that's going to lead to much wildlife benefit or, or plant diversity or make you very popular, you know, with your neighbors necessarily either. So Use it as a, a learning opportunity to do that. Great, thank you. Um, and I think all we're we've gone through all the questions. So thank you so much, Stephanie, for your wonderful information. And I think it's um, you know everything that Xerxes is. Um, 
offering on the website is, a, like you said, it's a wonderful resource. So I encourage everybody to check out the website and dig through all of those resources. There's so many. There really are. And it's pretty much everything you, you could ever hope for. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. Um, for those of you that are in the Chicagoland area, um, we're holding our native plant sale on Saturday, May 20th and 21st at Isle Alakash Museum in Romeoville, right off of Route 53 and not far from uh, 355. So come on out, talk with our native plant experts, and we'll get you set up with some native plants. <laughs> Thank you again, Stephanie. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Thank and you. happy gardening. And if you have any more questions? Yeah, happy gardening. Yeah. yeah thank you, everyone. <laughs> okay. Thank Take you care, so and we'll see you. I don't know where we'll see you, but hopefully somewhere. Yeah, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night.